ages of man. In the darkness of night, always has shown an unquenchable light. So take courage and follow the light that has shown. Always remember, man is not alone. Not alone as we reach for a star in the sky. Not alone as we live, nor alone as we die. Let us never despair in whatever we do. Someone is there who will help us come through. We are left on our honor, but not on our own. Always remember, man is not alone. Not alone as we reach for a star in the sky. Not alone as we live for a alone as we die. So take courage and follow the light that has shone. Always remember, man is not alone. Consider the grand design and the hand of the designer. In the beginning, he created heaven and earth. Before that was chaos. He said, let there be light. And darkness vanished from the deep. Let there be a firmament, said he. Let the waters separate. And there came dry land. One he called earth, the other the seas. And then the incredible miracle. Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after its kind, whose seed is in itself. Then came life, the moving creatures that lived in the water. Then the living creatures of the earth, the creeping things, the cattle, beasts, and fowls that fly over the earth. And then came man, formed of the dust of the ground, and the breath of God breathed into him. Would the Creator forsake His creation? How incredible it would seem to abandon that which God had so endowed with life and a soul, and to whom He had given dominion over all things in the earth, and who was the centerpiece of His master design. Consider the order, the adjustment of the stars and planets in their orbit the timing in his grand design. If the moon were closer, man would be engulfed in the tides. If the sun, man would be cast into unbelievable cold. Could a God who ordered a universe for man to inhabit then forsake him? He could do no other 
than lead man upon the pathway of spiritual perfection. God created man and did not forsake him. Man is not alone. God made man a creature of the spirit, but also of the flesh. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. The God who built the universe knew that man could be willful and wayward. He would succumb to the weaknesses of the flesh. He would learn cruelty and practice it. He would learn fraud, theft, deception, robbery, and to want what belongs to another. So was Cain inspired Achilles' brother for a birthright which did not belong to him. So was David inspired to look upon and lust for Bathsheba and then plot the death of her spouse. So was man moved to war and pillage and evil a folly that could bring disorder and destruction to mankind. So God summoned a man, Moses, strong, bearded, stately, a leader of his people. God called Moses to come into the mountain to hear the voice of he who designed all things. No other God before him. No images. They shall not take in vain the name of the Lord. Keep the Sabbath on the seventh day and do no labor. Honor father and mother. Abstain from killing, from adultery, from theft, from bearing false witness. And so it was that the grand designer spoke through his servant Moses to give man a word to guide him and to assure him that man is not alone. Since the dawn of time, man has spoken in music and poetry. Man has responded to the urgings of his soul by raising his voice in song. He has responded to the soft, sweet sounds of the harp and the flute or another's voice. How natural it was then for a man to respond to the God of the universe with a poem with his voice raised in song. In ancient days, there were many who sang the praises of God. Moses, Solomon, David, all poets in praise of the Lord, singers of song. 150 of their songs have come down to us through the centuries. But none is so familiar, so oft repeated, so comforting, so very personal in its message as the 23rd Psalm. It is a song of praise. Its words spoke of the world that man knew best in those olden days. The stony hillside, sheep grazing upon the sparse grass and watching over all the gentle shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The Lord is my shepherd, 
I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. journey from birth to death, man's soul reaches for God even as man's heart reaches for the stars. There came a man, a poor man born of poor parents. He grew strong and he became a carpenter. His shop in a remote village was his life until he was thirty. Then he left home to become a preacher, and for a time he gained a large following. But public opinion went against him and his gospel. A friend of his betrayed him to the local authorities. His closest friends were afraid, and they said they did not know the man. He was put on trial in a court of foreigners and was convicted by a jury of his own countrymen. He had to carry a cross to the place where they hanged him between two thieves. They gambled for his clothes, the only property he owned. And when he died, they buried him in a stranger's grave. Among the things that carpenter taught was a prayer. Its message has proved more durable than all the laws and edicts of 19 centuries of governments. Its promise has won more followers than all the ideologies of nations. Its comforting words have ministered to more weary and burdened men than all the agencies of man's devising. Its message is simple. God is the Father, and man is never alone. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. being who does not know temptation. The temptations of earth are many. The list is long, too long to recount. Misdeeds, 
uttering falsehoods, breaching the moral law, harboring revenge, taking what belongs to another, to hate, to blaspheme. These are but some of the cankerous temptations of every generation. It was even so with the man of Galilee. In the wilderness where he was hungry, because of his long fast, the devil tempted him to make stones into bread, to throw himself from the pinnacle with the taunt that if he were in truth the Son of God, angels would bear him up against all harm. To have all the kingdoms on earth, if he would but bow down and worship the evil one. But the evil one failed and departed. The great teacher then moved about to continue his ministry of healing, teaching and preaching. Multitudes followed him. At long last, he went up into a mountain. His disciples came to see him, and there he uttered the Sermon on the Mount. Part of that sermon has come to be called the Beatitudes. The word means blessed. It was his way of teaching and preaching. Observing the multitudes that had followed him to hear him preach, Jesus went up into a mountain and he taught them. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you, falsely for my sake. Rejoice, and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. A man named Paul was converted to the gospel of Christ. Paul, who had once been an antichrist and who boasted of his opposition to Christ's church, became its greatest salesman in Athens, in Corinth, in Rome. Paul said the church had its apostles its prophets, its teachers, its miracles, and its healings. But Paul said, I show you a more excellent way. Paul said, it was not by the tongues of men and angels, not by prophecy, not by mysteries, not by a faith that would move mountains, not by bestowing all his goods to feed the poor, not by giving his body to be burned, but by charity that the hearts of men would be one to God. 
And what is charity but love? Paul said there abideth faith, hope, charity, but the greatest of these is charity. Charity suffereth long and is calm. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. Charity seeks not her own, is not easily provoked, thinks no evil, rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Where there is charity, there is love. And where there is love, there is God. Then seven centuries ago, there lived a pious, humble man who became a saint. He was Saint Francis of Assisi, and he left us a prayer that expresses man's dependence upon God. Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. a young man whose life is a lesson to every man. In 20 months, he suffered 21 operations. The surgeons had removed one foot. They desperately sought to save the other. It was a bone tuberculosis. Now he was back in the hospital. He had heard of the noted Dr. Joseph Lister of England in Scotland, who had developed a new method for treating such infections. This young man, William Ernest Henley, after a life of agony, might well have let hope falter, let the will to live fade, let pain destroy the desire to carry on, let misery conquer his soul. In his hour of supreme agony, Words took form in his tired brain, living, pulsing words, which are an answer to every desperate moment of life. He called it Invictus, unconquerable. Here is Henley's deathless legacy. Out of the night that covers me, black is the pit, from pole to pole. I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. In the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winced nor cried aloud. 
Under the bludgeoning of chance, my head is bloody but unbowed. Beyond this place of wrath and tears looms but the horror of the shade. And yet the menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishment the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. such courage and resolve, man is not alone. It is we who make it so. Spending and earning, said the poet, we lay waste our powers. Then it can become a thing of quiet desperation. Could it be the neurotic combat of every day, the ugly, vexing clutter of debt, frustration in love, illness, friendship misplaced, that finally dwarfs the soul? and fear that the icy finger of dissolution may reach out at any moment to end the brief venture of life. It is then that a failing faith forsakes him, and he is ready to sob in the grip of this bundle of daily fears. He believes that he stands alone, but as certain as this is an ordered world, 
as surely as all things are part of the great design. As surely as God gave man dominion over every living thing that moves upon the earth, as surely as he breathed the breath of life into man's nostrils and made him a living soul, so surely man is not alone. of the late President John Fitzgerald Kennedy was a short prayer. O Lord, thy sea is so great and my boat is so small. John Kennedy was a sailor and so are we all. Every day all over the world, millions upon millions of people are tossed on the seas of their own vexations, battered by the troubles of a troubled world. But no man, even though he may feel he is hopelessly adrift upon the sea of life, is alone. O oh Lord, thy sea is so great, and my boat is so small. Man is not alone. Man is 